What's going on, everybody? I am grateful to be here with you all. Waints and ain'ts, it is Sabbath. So we say Walleluia and Wamen. Um, I'm Pastor BC Wade. I am um, here with you all this evening as we hop into this uh, message. And I don't know about y'all, I'm tired. Like, I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm tired of. <sighs> I'm tired of uh, election stuff and I'm tired of um, scandal and news. And so if it's okay with y'all, I'm not going to talk about any of that stuff today. I just need um, a good break. So y'all come on and join me in the book of Luke. Let's go to Luke. And we're going to live in chapter seven. Nope. Chapter 18. Um, God put something on me early uh, for you guys, and I really want to share it with y'all. Um, so we're going to read Luke chapter 18, but before I do any of that stuff, um, as you guys are coming, I see 11 of y'all in here. I want to um, I want to take this time, take this space to give a happy birthday to Dr. Gashugi, the father of our esteemed leader, who arguably without, we would not have Wakanda. So I want to give Dr. Gashugi a happy birthday. Uh, if he's watching, we celebrate you. I give you three birthday claps and a birthday salute. Um, we're grateful for you and for uh, the time that God has given us with you. Uh, 75 years is a great, great life. So I look forward to hearing uh, from you, your story, and and uh, celebrating with you what God has done. Y'all put your hands together and celebrate him. Type in the comments, happy birthday, Dr. Goshugi. Um, and we're going to get rolling. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Happy Sabbath. Come on, Wayne. Come on, come on, come on. So uh, we're in Luke chapter 18, and I'm going to read from verse 35 until verse 43. Luke 18, verse 35 to 43. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. Follow along in whichever translation you have with you. And we're just going to see what God has to say tonight. Uh, the Bible says in Luke chapter 18, verse 35, as Jesus was approaching Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the road begging. Now, hearing a crowd going by, he began to inquire what this was. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. Mm -hmm. And he called out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who led the way were sternly telling him to be quiet, but he kept on crying out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded that he be brought to him. And he went, and when he came near, he questioned him. Verse 41 says, what do you want me to do for you? I think it's one of the most gangster questions Jesus has ever asked in the text. What do you want me to do for you? Uh, and he, he answered, he said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. Verse 42. And Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and began following him, glorifying God. And when all the people saw it, they gave praise to God. I ain't got no title today, so don't ask me for one. But I do want y'all uh, to sit with me in this passage. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to gather here in the land of Wakanda. I thank you for the uh, protection of your spirit uh, manifested in the border tribe. Uh, I ask God that as we uh, sit in your presence, that you would speak to us, Father, that you would glorify yourself in this space, that you would allow us the ability to see you uh, in the stars and in the in the heavens, and that we would glorify your name. I ask that as you are glorified, that we would be edified in your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So uh, for those of y'all who are hopping on now, um, I already said it earlier. I am tired. I'm tired of election drama. I'm tired of church drama. I'm tired of drama, drama. I'm tired of it. And so uh, I don't feel like addressing any of that in uh, in this message to you this evening. And so um, I asked God, what am I allowed to do? And I'm going to tell y'all a children's story today. Uh, I want to go back to a basic story that you all might know about a man who sat on the side of the road to Jericho. And so on this day uh, where we are praising God uh, that he spoke to us uh, and said to us, uh, come, let us reason together, though your states be red as scarlet, 
Uh, let me stop. Um, so, so the text opens up here in verse 35. Jesus is approaching Jericho. So I want you guys to hear this. He is walking with a purpose. Jesus is on his way to Jericho. And those of you who are familiar with the passage in any way, shape, or form know that the reason why he's going to Jericho is because he has a divine assignment. He has an appointment, <laughs> though you're Stacey via Scarlet. He has an appointment there with a man named uh, uh, Zacchaeus, who was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree, but that's a story for another day. But Jesus is going to a town called Jericho. And on the way there, the Bible tells us that he passes by a man on the side of the road. And this man is begging. He's begging. He's, he's asking for those who are walking by to give him funds, to give him some money, to give him some help, to give him some aid. And what I find interesting is this man is asking, uh, he's inquiring from those who are going by uh, uh, for, for help. And in the middle of his inquiring, the text said that the blind man has the senses enough to perceive that something has shifted in the atmosphere. He, he notices that there's a, a, a buzz on the air that there wasn't before. He notices that the, the ground's a little bit more vibrating than it was before. There's more dust being kicked up. There are more voices on the air. And so the text tells us that he begins to inquire from those who are passing by, no longer asking that they would give him money, but now inquiring as to what is happening around him. And the, and the text says that as he's asking what's going on around him, the people begin to inform him that Jesus as Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And so I'm really glad for this point in the passage because it, it inspires me. Uh, the gift that I get from this point in the text is that God, uh, 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 he celebrates those who work in their discernment. Stay with me, y'all. This man who could not see had the presence of mind to inquire uh, as to the difference he felt in the atmosphere. This is good, y'all. Nobody came to him and said, hey, Jesus is coming. Nobody came to him and said, bro, could you slide out the way? Uh, something is happening. But he was perceptive enough to notice that there was a shift in the atmosphere. He was perceptive enough to notice that something around him had changed. And I wish uh, at the very least, the people of Wakanda would begin to posture themselves so that they'd be perceptive enough to notice when God is moving in spaces around them. I would suggest to you that the beginning of your change is in the ability to notice when God has primed the environment for movement. This is good, y'all. The text says that he notices something is different. And when he notices something is different, he opens his mouth and begins to ask those who are passing around him, fam, what's going on? What's happening? Now, the, the response is Jesus of Nazareth is passing by very plainly, very clearly. But what he then does blows my mind. See, they say, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He responds with a shout and his shout is this, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, some of y'all who are in this crowd are getting upset with him because not only is he blind, but he's also deaf. If he's not deaf, uh, um, uh, he's deaf in one ear, can't hear out the other, right? Uh, because I said to you that Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. I don't know who this son of David that you're talking about is, uh, but, but those who are perceptive, those who are aware in shifts in the environment are also aware of the nuanced differences in the titles that are being spoken in this passage. See, I'll stay with me. I feel like preaching. Uh, see, Jesus of Nazareth was the man who was born in common situations. But Jesus, the son of David, is the man who was born of, of a miracle birth. Y'all ain't here yet. Jesus of Nazareth uh, was the one who walked around performing circus tricks for those who asked of him. But Jesus, son of David, was the one who would perform a miracle in that he would save his people from their sins. Y'all ain't here yet. Jesus of Nazareth uh, is the one who, who, who came uh, when he was 
asked to do things at a wedding. He did parlor tricks. He was common. But not only were these things true, but Jesus of Nazareth was overlooked and underrated. However, Jesus, the son of David, came from a lineage that spoke to his uh, sovereignty. It testified of one who was slain before the foundation of the world. Jesus of Nazareth is a big deal, whereas Jesus of Nazareth is nobody really to write home about. What draws my attention to the passage is not only is this blind man the uh, uh, attentive and perceptive to a shift in the atmosphere around him, but he seems to be the only one in the space who can actually see. For while they are veiled, the crowd is veiled by their desire for Jesus to do for them. While they're unable to see him for truly is for who he truly is, the one who is blind is perceptive enough to dig through the facade and understand that this is God made manifest in our lives. He's able to recognize that there is a solution to every single problem that has come to him. How can you tell that, Pastor? Well, because at the beginning of the passage, he's asking for money. But in this portion of the text, he's asking for something deeper. Mm. At the top of the text, he's asking for money. But in this portion of the pericope, he's asking for mercy. This is exciting to me that he is able to not only discern the difference between Jesus of Nazareth and Jesus, the son of David, but he's also able to understand that you are to inquire differently of the two. Mm. Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus, the one who is underrated. Jesus, who is the child of a carpenter. Jesus, who is a product of poverty, uh, can, cannot do for you what you're asking him to do. The crowds who followed Jesus of Nazareth only came to receive food or a miracle or a pat on the back. But those who knew of Jesus, the son of David, came for something deeper. Y'all stay with me in this passage. The Bible says that he speaks to Jesus, the son of David, and says to him, I need you to have mercy on me. Let me slow down and teach for a second. Uh, the fact that he understands that Jesus of Nazareth translates to Jesus, the son of David, informs me that this man was not born blind. It informs me that this man did not always have the inability to see, but rather he was robbed of his sight. By one reason or another, he was rendered incapable of sight, but he did not begin there. And the reason why I'm able to say this is because the Jews had a notion that those who had an infirmity, those who had an imperfection in their flesh were not allowed to enter into the, 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 the temple. They could not gather there because it would... Uh, um, uh, uh, it, 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 would, it would desecrate uh, the temple, the holiness, the sanctity of the space. And so the fact that this man was able to hear Jesus of Nazareth and do the theological gymnastics in his mind, uh, recalling scripture from, from aeons past and, and tabulating those things in some type of spiritual syllogy to understand that Jesus of Nazareth was in fact Jesus who was prophesied by the prophets as the Messiah testifies that this man at one point was able to read the scriptures. This man at one point was able to frequent the temple. This man not only was able to frequent the temple and able to read the scripture, but this man was a product of the temple. This man was a product of a family that at the very least showed up to Sabbath school at 10, if not 9.30. This man was a product of a family that gave 10% tithe and 10% offering. This man was a product of a family that could testify as they pat themselves on the back that they were fourth and fifth generation Adventists. This man was a product of a family that was touched, y'all, not churched, touched. This man was a waint from waints past. He's not one of y'all new school Wakandans, Wakandans, but rather he was here from week one when there were, uh, before the 8K showed up. And this man, for one reason or another, has been rendered blind. Stay with
to me. And not only has he been rendered blind, but the text seems to suggest that he is the principal participant in removing his eyesight because he speaks to Jesus, the son of David, and says to him, I need you to have mercy on me. This is exciting to me, y'all. Uh, I'm still teaching for a moment. See, 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 we got to understand the difference here between mercy and grace. Stay with me, y'all. Grace is the bestowing on me that which I do not deserve. Y'all still with me? Uh, 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 grace says that I don't deserve the raise. I don't deserve the money. I don't deserve my beautiful wife. I don't deserve my chiseled husband. I don't deserve my position, but ain't God good from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. If he can transform red states to blue, surely he can put grace on me and give to me that which I did not deserve, nor did I merit. Somebody need to say grace. However, mercy is a whole different monster to wrap your mind around. See, mercy is different from grace in that while grace is the bestowing upon me that which I don't deserve, mercy is the removing from me that which I do. See, Toby has a song that says, try Jesus, not me. I sing that song often because whether or not you choose to believe it, I have hands. Uh, 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 and I've been saved for a while, but he's still working on me. Mm? And every now and then, if I'm pushed or prodded in a particular way, a, a, a left or a right might come out. It, it, it means that I did not intend for it to. Uh, you and I might have to find ourselves at the altar asking for my forgiveness after I've done something. So, so sometimes people are unaware of my ability to do what I do when I do what I do. Uh, uh, and if you are one of those individuals who were to walk up to me and put hands on me without knowing it, mm -hmm, you would have something coming. But but the spirit would speak to you prophetically and inform you of the fact that you had just made an error a grievous error uh, that, that, that I have still some parts of me that he's working to take out of me. And you would see that I was fixing myself to put these, I used to call them Ben Carson's, but not no more. I, I, I still have gifted hands though. Um, and I would put them on you. And in the moment where you saw them approaching, mm -hmm, you would speak to me and say, fam, have mercy on me. See, mercy or requesting mercy is a recognition of the fact that what you are about to receive, whether or not you want it, you deserve it. And you don't want to receive them. And so you're asking that the consequences of your actions be stayed or removed from you. The Bible says that this man who is sitting on the roadside blind is asking Jesus, the son of David, Jesus, Jesus, the one who came from heaven above to show uh, the way from the earth to the cross, his debt to pay. He's asking him to render upon him mercy. And the text is informing me that this man is saying to himself and to Jesus, I recognize that I am, I have a part to play in my blindness. I have a part to play in my condition. I have a part to play in my, in my standing. And I wish somebody in this space today could be brave and bold enough, big and bad enough to testify today in the presence of the tribal council that there is something in your life that you have to take credit for. That there's something you're asking God to remove from you that it is that, that is a result of something you have done, some place you have been, some activity you were involved in. God, I can't claim everything, but this right here is me. And I'm begging you, Lord, to have mercy on me, the text says, that as he's crying out to Jesus and asking him to have mercy, don't miss this, y'all, don't miss this, the text says that the people, stay with me, y'all, the people who led the way were sternly telling him to be quiet, but he kept crying out all the more. I might preach in a second, but let me just walk through this passage of scripture. If y'all still with me, say I'm here. Listen, the, the, the text says that he, he finds out, that is Jesus, 
in finding out it's Jesus, the son of David, he begins to cry out for mercy. When he cries out for mercy, the text says that those who are leading the way tell him to shut up, tell him to be quiet, tell him to close his mouth. Now, now, if this man were some of us, y'all don't be offended. It's me, y'all, it's me. Uh, if this man were like some of us here in Wakanda, if this man were like some of us here dealing with the problems of 2020, dealing with the issues and circumstances in our lives, dealing with uh, the weight of an election that I'm tired of reading and talking about, dealing with uh, familial issues and uh, uh, relational abuse and stress on your job. If it was one of us in this situation and the people who were leading the way told us to be quiet, we would sit down, fold our hands and shut our mouths. How can you say that? Because there are a lot of us in this space right now that are no longer active participants in any church because of what people who were leading the way said to us. Don't be offended. The text says that those who were leading the way told him to be quiet. But I want to point out something to you in case you missed it in the passage. Uh, there's a difference between being around Jesus and following him. <laughs> I want to say it this way. Uh, not everybody who is in the proximity of Jesus is following Jesus. In fact, the text says that the people who are telling him to be quiet are leading the way. Uh, not only are they not following Jesus, but they're walking in front of him. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're going ahead of him. Jesus in their lives, Jesus in their space is simply a resume booster. It's a name, it's a potential name drop in the future to say, oh, that crowd that was walking with Jesus. Jesus, yes, I was there among them, but not everybody who's around Jesus is with Jesus. Not everybody who's walking in the space where Jesus is, is actually following Jesus. And I find it difficult to understand the will of God for your life or anyone else if you are attempting to lead Jesus where he should go. Uh, but don't get, don't get this twisted. Just because they're around him doesn't mean they're following him. I'm speaking to people People who have been distraught and broken by recent events in Christianity, uh, those who have been turned away by Christianity because of what these Christian Republicans are doing and saying, those who have been turned away from churches because of what pastors or members have done, those who have stopped attending, those who have stopped watching, those who have stopped listening, those who no longer pray, those who no longer fast, those who no longer reach out. I'm speaking to you today. You've been turned off by what somebody who was around Jesus said, but I need you to get what the text is suggesting. Not everybody who's around him is following him. And the passage says that this blind man who we have already seen is more perceptive than most of us has discerned not only a shift in the atmosphere, has discerned not only the difference between Jesus of Nazareth and Jesus, the son of David, has discerned not only his solution is before him, but he's also discerned that proximity does not equal relationship. And therefore, despite what he is being told by those around him, the text says that he opens his mouth and cries out all the more. And I wish what kind of were full of people who had the gall, the unmitigated gall, the audacity in the face of detractors, in the face of those who would quiet you to open your mouth and shout out all the more those who are broken, those who are weary, those who are needy, those who feel useless, those who feel left out, locked down, looked over, those who don't find themselves comfortable in spaces where God is supposed to be. If you could get in yourself the fortitude to cry out despite the noise all the louder,
Father, Jesus, Son of David. Keep your mouth shut, Jesus, Son of David. I wish somebody could get in their spirit, and I'm not talking to you, fam. Attitude, a spirit that says, if you don't have a solution for me, then you don't have words for me, and would instead cry out to Jesus for their deliverance when they needed it all the more. The Bible says he cried out all the more, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. When he cried out, verse 40 says, Jesus stopped <laughs> and commanded that he be brought to him. Don't miss this, y'all. The text seems to infer that the reason why Jesus stopped is because the man continued to cry out. Therefore, one can infer that if he had not continued to cry out, that Jesus would have continued walking. Mm -hmm. And I want to speak to somebody today who's feeling like giving up. Ah, man. Who's feeling like, I don't want to do this anymore. Who's feeling like, I don't see the point in crying out anymore. I want you to understand that the reason why Jesus stopped here in the passage is because of the resilience of the one who called out to him. And if God has gifted you enough with discernment to recognize a shift in the atmosphere and understand that now is the time for you to receive your solution, then you better grab the Holy Ghost enough to persevere despite the detractors telling you that what you are saying, what you're doing, where you're going, and who you're calling out to is incorrect. The man cried out, Jesus stopped and commanded that he be brought to him. Text says this, when he came near, he questioned him. He, Jesus, questioned him, the blind man. What do you want for me to do for you? I'm almost done, y'all. I'm not gonna give y'all no points today. That's why I walked through this passage. I told you I don't feel like talking about anything serious, but uh, I want you to get this thing. Jesus asked him a specific question. What do you want me to do for you. And I want to suggest to you that many of us in this self same situation would have found ourselves listening to Jesus continue to walk down the road to Jericho because we would have left that interaction still blind. Jesus said, what do you want from me to do for you? And most of us would have responded to Jesus with our manicured, flowery prayers that mean nothing. Mm -hmm. Jesus, I, I, I wish that you would open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing onto me. Father, I pray that you would stretch out your hands now and touch me right where I am. God, I look to the heavens from whence come my help. And I pray that not only do I see where my help comes from, but that my help sees me here. Lord, if you would just send angels from Africa and angels from South America, uh, I hear the sound of victory. I hear the sound of victory. I hear the sound of victory and wondering why your victory seems to be going to somebody else. Somebody needs to hear that Jesus asked a specific question to the one who he he is in relationship with him. And oftentimes the one who he's in relationship with does not respond with a specific answer. Oh, I wish I could talk to somebody here about when I was a child and my mother would come home from work uh, a Sunday morning. She'd return from Brooklyn driving back to Queens and on her way because it was Sunday and because she felt good about us, she would often call us and she would ask us what she, what we wanted her to bring home for breakfast. Uh, my brother would say, I need you to bring me a uh, pastrami egg and cheese from the corner store. And, and my sister would say, uh, could you bring me uh, a, a, a beef patty, cocoa bread and cheese from the, from the, for the Jamaica spot. And, and me, I, I, I would always want for my mother to bring me uh, a, a pastrami 
egg and cheese um, on an everything bagel, slightly toasted and a nutriment. Y'all ain't from New York. I don't know about that. Uh, uh, bring me a nutriment. But 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 sometimes when my mother would would ask me what I would ask, what I want her to bring for me, I would respond with, well, whatever you have on your heart to do for me, Lord, or uh, what, 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 whatever you feel like giving me. And in truth, the reason why I asked my mother to do that for me is because a part of me did not believe that my mother would actually do what I was requesting of her. And I wish somebody in this space would be honest enough with themselves to say that there are times when you pray that you don't feel like God is going to respond in the affirmative, that God is going to do for you that which you are asking him to do. And therefore you pad your prayers so that when what you're asking for doesn't happen, you don't feel bad about it. But I need you to get this thing. You're not praying. You're not asking for anything. The text says, that God asked specifically, and I wish somebody could give him a specific answer. Isaiah chapter six, the Bible says that Isaiah the prophet looks at God in the temple, feels the temple quaking, sees the smoke rising, angels flapping their wings to and fro, holy, holy, holy. And he opens his mouth and says, lo, woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. And the Bible says that in that moment of repentance and confession, that an angel flew from formation, dropped down to the altar, grabbed a hot coal and touched Isaiah, not on the cheek, not on the forehead, not on the ear, not on the chest, but touched him on the lips because God is specific enough to deal with us at the place of our specific infirmity. God does not miss. God does not mess up. The issue is oftentimes we are too afraid to bring to God that which we actually need because of the fear that we won't find our solution and our request brought to fruition. But the Bible says here that this man who is able to perceive a shift in the atmosphere is also able to perceive that the one who is speaking to him is able to deliver. Jesus says to him, what do you want me to do for you? And without uh, 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 slipping, without grasping at straws, without painting his prayers with pretty flowers, the man matter of fact, matter of factly responds to Jesus and says, Lord, I want to regain my sight. I need somebody in this space to respond to a Jesus who's asking you, what do you want for me to do to you? Lord, I want you to restore my marriage. Lord, I want you to remove my love issues. Lord, I need you to take away this desire for this substance in my life. Lord, I need you to focus my attention. I need a specific prayer to go to a specific God. The man says, Lord, I want to receive, to regain, to have returned to me my sight. 43, Jesus says to him, receive your sight, your faith has made you well. <laughs> Y'all ain't here. Y'all ain't here. Uh, it seems as if the man's boldness, the man's belief that God would do what he was asking him to do was actually the catalyst, the agency by which his miracle was made manifest. The text says that Jesus says, receive your sight. It is your faith. Y'all ain't here that has made you well. Uh, it, it's, the, it's the fact that you believe enough in me to ask me specifically for what you need without doubt, without fear, without trepidation, without second guess. It's the fact that you had in you a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego faith, a faith that says, uh, look here, King, I see your puny furnace and your seven times hotter fire, but I need you to know that the God that we serve is able to deliver us from your hand and from your fiery furnace. But even if he does not, even if he chooses to leave us in there, he is still God. He's no less God. He's still bigger than you. He's still king on the mountain. He's still grasper of the wind. He's still God of angel armies. And I will not be deterred by a perceived uh, failure on his part to respond to my prayer. This man says, God, I don't care what uh, anybody else is going to ask you. I need you to give me 
me my sight. And Jesus says, your faith has made you well. Ooh, I'm almost done. But I want to see this thing real quick. Um, this, this makes me excited. Uh, the portion of your of this verse uh, that says, receive your sight, your faith has made you well. Your version said your faith has made you well or made you whole. Uh-huh. Uh, but the Greek has a word in there, uh, and that word is sozo. Y'all say sozo with me at home, y'all Greek scholars. Now watch this now. Uh, sozo does not mean to be made well. Sozo means saved. And so what Jesus is saying here in the passage is not only has your faith brought you to me to allow you to receive healing, but your faith has also granted you salvation. Y'all missed the fact that this blind man was asking Jesus to have mercy on him. I missed the fact that this blind man was acknowledging that there was something in his life that led him down this road to blindness. There's something in his life that put him on this path to poverty. There was something in his life that put him in this place and he was repenting and asking for God to do something in his life. And God said, not only has the physical manifestation of your sin been taken care of, but your faith has allowed me the opportunity to cleanse you of all unrighteousness and to place you before me as spotless. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us before his presence with exceeding joy to the only wise God, be all glory, honor, dominion, and power. He says, your faith has saved you because Jesus is able to heal not only the physical, but the spiritual. So if you have the faith enough to know that the one who you request is not only able, but willing to do for you. If you are perceptive enough to note the shift in the atmosphere, to take stock of the fact that God is moving in spaces around you and has presented himself as a solution for your problem. God spoke to this man and said, receive your sight. Take your salvation to <laughs> your faith has saved you. Now, I love this, y'all. 43, I'm done. The Bible says immediately he regained his sight. Y'all didn't hear that thing. He said immediately he regained his sight. In the moment he asked, he received. And the text says that uh, uh, he received his sight and began following Jesus. I love this thing because the passage opens up with some people who are leading the way. But the representation of those who have been saved uh, manifests itself not in leading Jesus, not in desiring for him to go your way, but rather the manifestation reveals itself in a submission to God in those who will follow where he leads. The text says that immediately he received his sight and began following him, glorifying God. And when all the people saw it, they gave praise to God. I'm done. Close my Bible so y'all don't think I'm keeping y'all here all night. Watch this thing. The text says that the people who were uh, uh, previously leading the way, the people who were previously quieting him down, the people who were previously out of touch with what Jesus was doing, the people who could not see what Jesus was doing, where Jesus was going, because they were not looking at him, but rather were ahead of him, now saw what God had done in his life and began to praise God for it. Not only did he receive his sight, not only did he receive his salvation, but those around him received a paradigm shift in that they were finally able to perceive God for who he truly was. This took place because the blind man was perceptive enough to know that something was different around him. And I wish some blind people on this thread right now, I wish some blind people in this comment section right now, I wish some blind people on this live right now would become perceptive to the fact that God is moving 
right now, that God is shifting this space right now, that God is making ways in the desert right now, that he's making rivers in the wilderness right now. If the border tribe would do me a favor and open the doors of the church and allow those who are in this space, Pastor Josiah, I know we haven't established a protocol to do this, but I'm asking that those of you who are in this space right now and saying, God, I am blind, but desire the ability to see. I desire the ability to be able to receive my salvation. I want to see. I'm asking that you would type in the comment section right now. It's me, Lord. It's me. Type in the comment section and we're going to pray for you that God would give you the ability to perceive the shift around you, that God would give you the ability to discern who he truly is, that you would see him and not those who are leading him, that you would see him and not those who profess to be around him, that you would not be driven from the spaces where he is, but that rather you would find yourself wrapped so tightly around him that people can't tell where you stop and he begins, that you would find yourself like Georgia flipping for him. I wish somebody in this space right now would make their step themselves available to receive what God desires for you. It's me, Lord. It's me, Lord. And we're going to pray right now that God would do this tonight in your life, that God would do this right now. And I'm going to add something to this uh, because I'm going to leave you here in this Face. If there's somebody here today who needs something more than this, you need special prayer. You need to be connected to somebody. You want someone just to walk with you. You need to hear somebody lift up your name before God. I'm going to I'm going to burden him right now and I'm going to ask you to type in the comment section. Call uh, 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 Pastor Josiah. Help. Pastor Josiah, help, and he will reach out to you via message. He will reach out to you, and we will pray for you personally. I'm going to pray right now. I won't take up too much time, but I need somebody in this space to receive what God is doing in this space right now. Will all of you lift your hands and pray with me? Father, we thank you. We thank you for putting us in places where we have the opportunity to pass you by or to see you passing us by. We thank you, God, for putting us in situations where we can discern your movement. We ask, God, that as you move, that you would emanate blessings, God, that you would allow them to fall on us, that we might know truly that this is Jesus, not of Nazareth, not the circus monkey, not the, 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 the prophecy pimp, not, not, not who we are shown of you on TV, but the son of David, the Messiah, the chosen one, the lamb who has become a lion slain from before the foundation of the world, we were, are able to perceive you for who you truly are and receive that which you have for us. God, we recognize now that what we have received today are residual blessings for you were on your way, God, somewhere else. You were headed. You had a divine appointment, God, on Calvary. You were meeting with Jericho in, uh, meeting with Zacchaeus in Jericho. But God, you stopped on the way for little old me. You stopped on the way because I cried out to you. The songwriter says, Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. And today we're begging you not to pass us. And we're celebrating your desire to stop on the way and meet with us where we are. Father, I'm asking that each and every one of us tonight, we receive a portion of your Holy Spirit. That you, God, would touch us in the spaces where we need you to do so. But we're not praying a pretty, flowery, empty prayer prayer, God. I'm asking that you would give us by your spirit the ability tonight to utter to you that which we need. And as we speak it, God, plainly, I pray that you would move on our behalf. Father, we thank you for hearing us and meeting with us tonight. And we ask that even as we disconnect this live, as the lights go out, the computers close, and we begin to go our separate ways, that we not be able to separate ourselves from your spirit. Father, we thank you and love you. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Well, kind of Man, as usual, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to celebrate with you all this evening. Uh, those of you who are going to sleep with lighter hearts uh, because colors around the world are shifting, uh, I pray that God be your peace, uh, that whether or not recounts uh, are able to shift the, the climate and culture, um, that nothing would be able to shift your foundation in Jesus. And I ask uh, 
that you would find rest today for your weary souls, that the battle will be fought later, but now that you would take the time to allow God to minister to you. I look forward to seeing y'all uh, on some other uh, posts somewhere in Wakanda, probably on somebody's trash post about Chicago pizza. But until then, can't wait to see y'all. God bless you. Grace and peace.